<laughs> All right, very much a party atmosphere we've seen in, in some of those watch parties, and especially here, again, the music, the exhibits, all the things happening here kind of reminds me of a sporting event, you know? So because of that, I'm going to ask you, who's the GOAT today, right? Is it the moon, is it the sun, or is it the earth? I mean, I'm a lunar scientist, so maybe <laughs> a little biased, but you got you got to go with the moon on this one, right? It's the moon that is like coming in for the block today. It's all the action to the moon. I love that sport sports <laughs> reference, but I'm gonna have to say Earth, because we, well, first of all, we love our home planet, right? <laughs> but because we're here, the moon has something to project its shadow on, and that's why we have the celestial alignment and show we're about to see today. That's that's where I'm going. That's how I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> eh. All right, and now we want to know which team you're on. Uh, you can cast your vote by going to at NASA Solar System on Facebook X or Instagram, and we'll, we'll reveal the winning team at the end of the broadcast. <coughs> Earth. <laughs> the moon shadow will only be over land for about an hour and 28 minutes today, moving at an average speed of about 1,900 miles an hour. Keeping track of it for us is NASA's James Traley. Yeah, thanks so much, Megan. I'm gonna have to go with option number three there, the sun, because it gives us the energy for us to thrive here on Earth. And speaking of energy, it is bustling here at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. I'm coming to you from our new Gateway exhibit, where we today only have a partial eclipse, but still super excited to be tracking all of today's events live with our Eclipse Explorer. This right here is a fantastic tool that was developed by our friends at NASA Goddard Science Vis Visualization Studio. They put this tool together for us to track the eclipse down to the exact second. If you wanted to get an access to this yourself, get a feel for how this is gonna look in your neck of the woods, you can go to go.nasa.gov forward slash Eclipse Explorer and you can track where your city is going to be, your zip code, by punching it into this little box here. It's going to snap right to your location and give you some key stats. You just saw Cleveland there, so I can bring them up here. Cleveland is expecting peak totality here to start at 3.13.45 to be precise. Local time, they've got a time of totality of 3 minutes, 49 seconds. Plenty of time to really sit back and bask in their moment in the fully eclipsed sun. I'm gonna be tracking all of this all throughout the afternoon for you to make sure that you do not miss a second of this coverage. Even if you're outside of that path of totality like we are right here, more than 99% of the US is gonna be able to see at least a partial eclipse. Some places are already experiencing, you just saw that footage from Mazatlan a little while ago, they're already experiencing a partial eclipse. And as always, if you are in partial, be sure to wear proper eye protection to protect your vision so you can safely enjoy today's fantastic celestial event. Plenty of awesome stuff coming up. We're going to keep a keen eye on that weather. Cleveland's looking nice and beautiful. Very clear skies. Megan, back to you. Thank you, James. And joining us now is Dr. Bob Lehman, a heliophysicist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much. So talk to us. Today's total solar eclipse, it's going to look very different from what we saw seven years ago, right? It is, right. The sun is going to look, the solar corona is going to look very cool today. It's going to look cooler than it did last time. Uh, and I mean cool in the sense of wow. Uh, <laughs> not, cold. Uh, not, <laughs> not, not, not cold, because the solar corona is like a million degrees. Um, but compared to, to last time, uh, was close to the solar minimum, the minimum amount of magnetic activity sure. on the sun. There's this 11 year or so cycle, and 2017 was closer to minimum, and, and 2024, April 2024 is pretty much close right to the, the maximum of that. So we're gonna see the maximum amount of, of dynamism of, of, of activity and and it's going to look uh, you'll see rays shooting out uh, and does that increased activity mean that we have a chance for new discoveries today and increased science uh, sure um, so in addition to the science that will be done because of the eclipse just greater activity levels means that we have more chance to see what the Sun is going to do increased radiation levels uh, increased activity er eruptions that, that that will affect the the earth um, things so that so how does that affect the Earth, and how do we study those effects? What do we have, the tools, the assets to study those effects? Uh, sure, so in, we call the whole general thing sp space weather, so we get increased radiation or, or what we call coronal mass ejections, chunks of the sun that blow off and... and, 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 and And, and hit the Earth, um, and those affect things like power grids and radio communications and GPS satellites, um, all of which are you know, every, everyday real implications for, for that thing that's 93 million miles away. And how do you feel? Like
you know, you're a heliophysicist. This is kind of like your Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, pretty so much, yeah. <laughs> you, you are not the first person to say that to me today. <laughs> and, and are we right? Uh, pretty much, yes. I mean, this this is it. I mean, se seven years, and, and, and I like to say there's the... The, the, the diving, you know, trying to reach the goal line from the Super Bowl what, <laughs> 15, 20 years ago that was like, you know, totality, not totality. And and yeah, today today is it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and we will have a, a, a whole bunch of fun here. Yeah, again, uh, eclipses are a unique opportunity to really study the sun and how it affects us. So I know that, again, your fellow heliophysicists and really uh, across, uh, across uh, the uh, uh, disciplines of science, I know that today, is really special for a lot of people. It is, yes. Thank you, Bob. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. All right, it's time now to check in with our first team along the path of totality. Here is Tahira Allen in Kerrville, Texas, a city so lucky it gets a solar total uh, uh, solar eclipse twice in a single year. Thanks, Megan, and welcome to Kerrville, Texas. I'm Tahira Allen with NASA Communications, and I'm Gina DiBraccio, the deputy director of heliophysics at NASA Goddard. We're live from the Kerrville Eclipse Festival, where tens of thousands are gathering to witness the second solar eclipse that has passed through this town in just six months. Now, this is incredibly rare, and people have traveled from all over the world to share in this spectacular moment right here at the crossroads of the eclipse. Now, Gina, we were lucky enough to be here last year That's for the right. annular solar eclipse. How does it feel to be back? You know, the annular was such a spectacular experience, but I'm already feeling even more energy today, and it's I'm like so double excited to be here. It yeah. is. Yeah. No, and, and we have a full day of celebration in store. You know, the town really turned out for this event. This morning we heard from the mayor, and we are surrounded with food and Great. shopping and different activities. I think I saw the Texas State Astronomy Club I, here yeah, we did. giving out free telescope viewings. So it's just a really, really special moment for people to come together and enjoy this celestial event. It's right to hear it. And you know, we had some cloud coverage today. It's looking to be it's, pretty yeah, good It's going though. back and forth. So you know, tease, fingers crossed. Regardless of how this turns out, we have live music and dancing afterwards. So it's going to be a good day. Absolutely, and you know, I mean, this is gonna be my first total solar eclipse. Awesome. And so last year was incredible with the annular. Folks, if this is your first total solar eclipse, let us know in the comments wherever you're watching. We'd love to hear it. So this is also a good time to remind everyone that it is not safe to look directly at the sun without specialized eye protection for solar viewing. Now that is except during the brief phase where the moon is completely covering the sun. And that will only be for those in the path of totality. Now we have a special guest that you might recognize popping in to share some important tips to make sure you stay safe during today's events. Hi Eclipse enthusiasts, Lance Bass here, and I wanna tell you how to protect those eyes and stay safe during a solar eclipse. During these celestial events, the sun, earth, and moon are in sync, creating solar eclipses.
markets going up and it'll be a good day for that. Great, and hopefully we'll get to see a replay of that later on in today's show. That's right. Now, folks, it is really special for us to be back here in Kerrville, Texas, covering today's total solar eclipse. Just last October, an annular solar eclipse passed right through this town. Now, for a location to be at the crossroads of these two incredible celestial events is rare. Let's take a look at how the community has been preparing in the lead up to this big day.
exactly. And so now coming up soon, we're going to get our first views of the total solar eclipse as begins in Mexico, sweeping across North America. We have correspondents all along this path who are going to bring you live into the action as it happens. First up, let's check in with Joy Young in Dallas, Texas. Thanks to Harry and Gina. So welcome to the Dallas Arboretum and Botanical Garden. I'm Joy Ung, and as you can see behind me, we have a lot of people eagerly waiting for the total solar eclipse. It's so amazing to hear so many people talk about the sun and the moon. And what makes this day even special is that the eclipse gives scientists a really unique chance to do science. So to tell me more, I'm here with NASA scientist, Dr. Ashley Greeley. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Joy. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so firstly, how are you feeling about today? Oh, I'm feeling really excited. The skies are starting to clear out and it looks like we might get a pretty good show. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so earlier in the show, we learned that today's eclipse will look quite different from the 2017 eclipse. Mm -hmm. We're going to see more structures in the sun's outer atmosphere. So Ashley, can you tell me why is that different? Why is the sun going to look different and why is it changing? Sure. The sun goes through phases, which we call a solar cycle, that last roughly 11 years. And those are periods where the sun is less active and periods where the sun is more active. We're entering a time of solar magnitude maximum, which is really exciting because that means that the sun is more active. Its magnetic fields are, are more dynamic. Uh, we may see features here such as streamers, which looks like little uh, spiky wisps in the sun's atmosphere, which we call the corona, uh, and then little prominences, which look like little pink arcs on the surface of the sun. Um, yeah, we're really excited to see this, and we, we hope that we'll see some really interesting features. There may be a little bit of asymmetry as well in the, the magnetic fields, and I don't know, I guess we'll have to find out in about an hour. <laughs> so the sun is changing. So do those, affect, so do those changes affect life on Earth at all? Sure, yes. Uh, the sun does affect life here on Earth. Uh, we have a term that we call space weather, which applies to the field of study of everything from the sun uh, to the Earth and in between and, and how that affects uh, life here. We are fortunate that on Earth uh, we are protected from, from things coming from the sun by our magnetic fields, which shield us from those explosions that, that come from the surface of the sun that we, we talked about. Um, and those can result in really fun occurrences, such as the aurora. Uh, there can be some negative side effects, but those are mostly limited to things that are outside our magnetic fields. Uh, the, the storms from the sun can interfere with satellites, and it's something we really have to think about as scientists as we, we start to plan for putting humans on the surface of the moon or potentially sending them to Mars. Uh, those energetic particles that result from the sun uh, can impact humans, so that's just something that we have to, to learn about and take into account. So the sun is always there, of course, but why are eclipses a good time to study these effects called space weather? Yeah, eclipses are a really cool time uh, for scientists to be able to study the sun. It's actually, it's really hard to completely cover the disk of the sun in order to study the, the sun's atmosphere, especially that inner part of the atmosphere. Uh, we're really fortunate that here on Earth, our moon is just the right size and just the right distance from Earth that it can completely block out uh, the sun's disk during total solar eclipses. Uh, so we're really able to observe that inner atmosphere in a way that we, we can't normally. So this event is really exciting for, for both scientists and the public alike, and that's just such a, a cool experience to share together. Thank you so much, Ashley. So if you're lucky enough to be in the path of totality, keep an eye out for that sun's outer atmosphere, the corona, and, keep, and you'll know that you see these spiky features and it's because the sun is heading towards its most active phase. So for now, let's head to our friends in Russellville, Arkansas. Jasmine, how are things looking on your side? Joy, things are looking absolutely fabulous in a very sunny downtown Russellville, Arkansas. As she said, I'm NASA's Jasmine Hopkins, and I am coming to you live from the Depot District, where the city is throwing a massive block party, all in celebration of the total solar eclipse. Now, people in Arkansas have great reason to celebrate because this is only the second total solar eclipse visible from the state since it was first established in 1836. And the next one visible from here won't happen for another two decades. So people around me are gearing up for what feels like a once in a lifetime opportunity. Now, it's not just the residents of Russellville that are excited. On average, the city has about 29,000 residents, but for the past eight months, they've been preparing to receive upwards of 100,000 tourists right here in the city. Now, of course, NASA has been a big part of that preparation. So to show you what we've been doing to help, I have a video here to show you. So we have been talking to the next generation of space explorers 
right here in Arkansas. We started off at Arkansas Technical University and then we moved on to Russellville City Schools where we spoke to hundreds of students all the way from 8th grade to 12th grade about this total solar eclipse. We had NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, the Arkansas Air National Guard, the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, and even the Paris Observatory joining us all the way from France. Now, during that moment of totality, Arkansas will experience from 94 to 100 percent obscurity from the sun and we'll have four minutes and 12 seconds to really soak in that fantastic cosmic event. Now, until that moment, of course, we are telling the residents to stay safe, uh, keep those solar eclipse glasses on. But now let's go from Arkansas to Illinois with Blair Allen. How are things looking for you? <laughs> Jasmine, we're super excited here because crowds are filing into the stadium. But the main story here is the weather. Everything looks absolutely good and clear for totality today. We're very excited. We're just hoping just like 2017, a little cloud doesn't come in and obscure things. But I tell you what, there's been a total solar eclipse here in 2017. Observation did not stop at SIU. Joining us now are two SIU students who actually did some observing. This is Callie and Paige. Now, Callie, I know that you guys went to Australia in 2023 and you observed the, the uh, totality using an interesting technique. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so when we were in Australia, we used a sun funnel um, to view it. And what it does is it projects basically what the tele telescope is seeing onto a film and um, so a sun funnel is just basically a, a funnel with two host clamps and rear projection film and it just projects the sun and we actually captured a picture of totality as that eclipse was happening. And it's pretty cool because it allows other people instead of having to go through the eyepiece right. you get to see it. Pretty right. impressive. Now Paige you guys are going to do some observation today. What are you set up for here in Carbondale today? Yes so we have we have two telescopes set up with the sun funnels for viewing for a select view of the public and right now we're pointed at the sun and we're excited to see totality. Now what are your odds on good weather? Uh, it's looking pretty good. I'm excited. <laughs> Isn't that great? I'm so excited. I tell you what, one final question because I know you're experts with uh, solar safety, <laughs> but uh, Team Earth, Sun or Moon? We're both team, team moon. moon. Team Moon, Team Sun. I tell you, that's the bet you're going to get, but we're all pro eclipse. Uh, back to you, Tahira. Let's go team moon. So <laughs> as you can see, folks, we've got a lot of exciting things in store all across this country. And that was only half of it. You're going to meet three, mo three more of our locations later on in the show. Now, Gina, we've got a ton of questions coming in online right now from our viewers. Yep. How do you feel about some Q&A? Let's answer some. Okay, perfect. Let's do it. So our next our first question is from Fair Cerritos on Instagram who wants to know, how can I help NASA? You can help NASA by participating in the eclipse. If you can see it today, go outside, enjoy the moment, or download the Globe Observer app. You can do that right now before the eclipse crosses your path. You need a thermometer, and you just record the local temperatures and the cloud coverage. Fantastic. Globe Observer app. So thank you so much, Gina, and thank, thank you. you to everybody sending in those questions. We'll take some more later on throughout the show. For now, let's check back in with Megan and Sarah in Cleveland, who are standing by with an out-of-this-world surprise. <laughs> yes, quite literally that to hear of because we have a special treat for our viewers right now. Joining us live in space, 250 miles above the Earth in the International Space Station. Everyone, please help us welcome NASA astronauts Jeanette Epps and Mike Barrett. Sarah, you've been waiting. I'm so excited. <laughs> for this. Oh, there they are. Hello, everyone. Oh, Jeanette, Mike, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Uh, it's a pleasure to join you guys, and uh, I, I hope everybody appreciates NASA scheduling this uh, eclipse to uh, bring the world together. <laughs> yes, thank you so much to NASA, and thank you so much for joining us. Now you guys will have three opportunities to view the moon's shadow over North America, and that last pass will give you guys the best views. And we hope to also share those live views with everyone here on this broadcast around 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. Now, Jeanette, I have two questions for you. Are you looking forward to being one of the few people seeing today's total solar eclipse from space? And two, I know your crew member, Matt Dominic, will use a camera with a solar filter to photograph the sun being eclipsed by the moon. Will you also be taking photos of the celestial alignment.
I'm definitely taking pictures of the solar alignment. Um, I, and I think we're very fortunate to be here at this um, special vantage point to see such a special event at this time. So I'm definitely excited. What about you, Mike? What's going through your mind as you're preparing to, to see such an awe-inspiring event? Well, admittedly, I'm a bit of an eclipse junkie. Uh, you know, I, my first one was uh, like when I was 19 with the homemade telescope in the desert. And uh, a few since then, and actually during the 2017 eclipse, I was on a, a chartered aircraft uh, several hundred miles off the coast of Oregon watching it and uh, I got a strange bucket list and this is one of the things that's on it to actually watch a, an eclipse shadow across the earth from space so I'm ecstatic to see this box gets checked and and just to, to see this amazing thing from up here yeah the fact that that was actually a box on your list is pretty <laughs> amazing. amazing and then now it's getting checked so you know for those wondering this is what the moon's shadow will look like to Jeanette and Mike uh, we're going to show you video taken from the space station of the total solar eclipse in 2017 and you can clearly see the shadow moving across the top of your screen there from left to right we actually sped up the video so you can see more of that transit this would look a lot slower to them but really cool Jeanette eclipses give us a unique opportunity to study the sun and how it affects the earth can you tell us about the atmospheric waves experiment attached to the outside of the space station right now sure um, we have an atmospheric wave experiment that's going on now and what it looks at are these atmospheric gra gravity waves. And these waves transport energy and momentum up through the climate system. So with the imager, with the imager on the atomic wave experiment, we're gonna look at how these atmospheric gravi gravity waves impact our Earth's climate, how it can impact our, our space and global and all of our comms, how it can affect our navigation system, and so over the next two years, researchers will use a, an infrared imager to look at the global distribution of these waves as well as their characteristics. Mike, how does it, how does it feel to have a hand in maintaining the space station so that important uh, science like the atmospheric waves experiment can happen? Well, of course, uh, the main reason we're up here is actually to conduct that science. <clears throat> we maintain the station to, uh, to keep this platform what it should be, what it was built to be, which is a vibrant uh, laboratory, uh, which covers so many different disciplines on the inside and the outside, like the gravity waves experiment. I mean, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege, as much as anything, to have a hand in that science. And we end up being basically the eyes, the hands, the on-site presence to conduct that science. And we get to be the first to see results of just amazing things that are years in the making by a bunch of really smart, ambitious uh, scientific teams on the ground. So that's really where the joy is. Uh, maintaining the station is just like maintaining a research ship, uh, something I actually uh, quite like. Uh, so I feel very much at home in that, uh, in that role. It's still blowing my mind. I mean, we're here in Cleveland, Ohio, live. You guys are up in space in the International Space Station. I can't believe the opportunity that uh, has been afforded to us, and I hope our viewers really enjoyed uh, this time with you. And I hope you enjoy the show from up there. All right. We have, um, but uh, we do want to close by saying, uh, first of all, we all right. really enjoy being here, but everybody stay safe. Uh, and use the simple means to protect your eyes as you look at the eclipse, as uh, Jeanette and I are modeling here, which makes us blind as a bat on the inside, but uh, solar protected on the outside. So we encourage everyone to do the same. Really great advice from yes. both of them. Thank you so Thank much. You Sarah and I have our glasses, right. and we're we ready, ready to go. To. Also blind. <laughs> if we don't do this <laughs> all right again Jeanette Mike thank you so much and we actually have some time to take questions from the audience we have hashtag Eclipse that's how you can send questions to us so let us take a video from another curious kid Excellent. we have watching hi my name is AJ my question is why will we not see a total eclipse in California thank you 
That's a great question, Adrian. So we only have precious few today are going to get to see a total eclipse because the moon is so much smaller than the Earth. It only casts a very narrow shadow. But still, even in California, you're going to get to see a partial eclipse, and that is still a really cool event. So I do encourage you to get out there uh, and see it for yourself today. Yeah, absolutely. So again, hashtag eclipse. Wherever you're watching us, drop that in the comments, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can on the show. Okay, so we have obviously people celebrating with us online. Uh, and at events across the country. So why don't we check out some of those events again now? Waco, Texas again. People look very, very comfortable in their camping chairs and spread out on picnic blankets. Huh? They look like they're having a good time. Yeah. A few clouds. A few clouds, but again, they have some time there before. Kennedy Space Center, they will see a partial eclipse. We have some people walking around the rocket garden. Oh, it looks like they have beautiful weather there. California Academy of Sciences, yes, they do. They have <laughs> clear skies. We're very, very jealous over here. And then the Mentor Civic Amphitheater that's starting to... It's starting to fill up. Exactly. There were fewer people when we yeah. checked in ago, but now lots of people there and lots of people at the Adirondack Sky Center. I wish I could wave and say hello. <laughs> they look like they're getting, they're getting ready for some stuff, though. Yeah, absolutely. They've Again, the snow cleared so, out because yeah. there was snow over the weekend, but now it looks like a beautiful, probably still crisp day there for them. Okay, and now we're back here with astronaut Steve Bone, who's looking around, taking in the sights, Steve. I, I am. It's just an amazing amount of people. It's really cool to see. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You really can yeah. feel the energy. And, and it's, it's really cool that you're here. So Steve is here because, you know, obviously, as we've been saying throughout the show, you really should have these glasses to safely <laughs> view the eclipse. But if you don't have glasses, that's why Steve is here. So Steve, I see that you brought some supplies for us. I did. I have a little bit for everybody, and we'll see how we can do here today. All right. So this is like a pinhole viewer, and so... It's a, basically a pinhole camera. I don't know if you ever had to do that when you were a kid. Is make a little camera by basically poking a hole on a piece of paper. Okay. And, and then using that to focus on to a screen. Okay. And so well, we all have pins here, I, I guess. Yes. Got my so we have a paper pin. plate. We <laughs> have yeah, index <laughs> card. And we have pins. And I have my Crew 6 pin. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> all right. So what do we do, Steve? Basically, all you have to do is poke a hole in the, in the cardboard. Okay. And the size of the hole will determine the focal length, the focal distance of your viewer. Okay. And it has to be big enough that the light will come through. And mm -hmm. it's uh, it's sometimes hard to do if we don't have like direct sunlight. So you want to make sure you have a big a big enough hole. I think okay. that would probably okay. be enough. Yep. And then what you'll end up doing, if we had the sun, you could basically, over your shoulder, don't look at the sun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sun behind right, us. Right, sun right, behind right. us. Yes. And so you hold this Ooh, up, and that. you'll see, you can actually get, there it is, I can see. We do see it with the lights, yep. the studio yeah. lights. You only yeah. need a little <laughs> bit, and then depending on how far in and out you move it, and the size of the hole, that gives you the, your focal length. Got it. Just and like a lens. And basically, like we're saying with the studio lights, if something were, were to pass over the studio lights, that same uh, um, shadow, essentially, yes. would be a clip, uh, would be projected through Absolutely. the index card right now. That's how you safely watch it. That is a good, safe way to watch it. There's a lot of other ways to see it as well. I know and, that. Uh, oh. I have that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm prepared. Right? Colander, right? Yeah. So that's a lot of fun because if, you, uh, if you're if you in a very an open area like this today and you, you don't have your glasses or you just want to see something really cool, again, put it over your shoulder and hold it, and you'll get a, a big array of all those little eclipses happening on the cool. ground below you. Yeah, actually, I think we have a picture of that. I'd love to see that because really it is yeah, a very, pretty. yeah, perfect. Yeah. Look at that, Steve. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> even if you don't have anything, right, you can yeah. actually use your hands to make your own sort of improvised pinhole camera. Absolutely. <laughs> That's amazing. And, you know, I, I, I was explaining a little bit ago that uh, in my own yard during the last, the annual eclipse, when I was I was out working in the yard, and I said, hey, is there an annular eclipse going on? So I went under a tree, and I was looking at a tree, and then on my driveway, all these little eclipses, oh, just hundreds amazing. of them. Oh, that's amazing, yeah. And Beautiful. it's absolutely amazing Beautiful. pictures. Great. So I hope so. if people have trees near them, they can take a look at that. Steve, thank you so much You're for being welcome. here. You're very welcome. We really appreciate have it. Have a great day. All right, so the eclipse is getting closer and closer to the west coast of Mexico. We will experience totality there at uh, Mazatlan, in particular, 2.07 p.m. Eastern Time. So let's head back over to James at our eclipse board for another look at the path of totality. Yeah, thanks so much, Megan. A lot coming up very soon, and make sure you know exactly when to go outside to observe that totality if you're on our path 
or even right now if you're experiencing a partial eclipse, I've got in our Eclipse Explorer here, I can zoom out just a hair here to show you this, I've got our penumbra on. So this is all the places inside here already experiencing a partial eclipse. You've been seeing some great feeds from our camera in Mazatlan, Mexico. They've been experiencing that kind of crescent sun for a little while now. They're just about 20 minutes out from actually experiencing totality itself. They're going to have a long window where they are, 4 minutes and 17 seconds. For some context, back in 2017, the last eclipse that swept across America, the longest time was only around 2 minutes and 40 seconds. That was in Carbondale. This time around, some very long times, just a little bit northwest of Torreón, Mexico. They're going to get upwards of four and a half minutes. A lot of time to really observe it, but just make sure that you know when to be outside. And as always, access that tool at go.nasa.gov forward slash Eclipse Explorer. This is going to keep moving on. You see this little thing. I have this actually running in real time. This is our shadow of totality. This is going to continue to move further and further to the northeast and actually make landfall in just a few moments in Mazatlan, Mexico. As you've seen all throughout the broadcast, we've got correspondents all up and down the U.S., all the way up to Maine, covering this live. Very excited to continue tracking this. Make sure you know what's going on here. But for now, back to you, Megan. All right, thank you, James. So now let's introduce you to more of our correspondents along the path, starting first with NASA's Lauren Ward, standing by to show us what's happening in Indianapolis, Indiana. That's right. Thanks, Megan. We are at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in Indianapolis, Indiana. It is a gorgeous day. Behind me, I have over 50,000 people here to spectate today. Today, we are waiting for a spectacle that is of a celestial kind. Of course, this is most known for the Indy 500, but we are waiting for something a little bit special today. With me, I have the 2016 Indianapolis Motor Speedway winner, Alexander Rossi, good to see you. Good to see you, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it's great to have you. So the Helio Big Gear is a celebration of sun science and how the sun touches everything, including IMS. So tell me, uh, the track when you're doing a qualifying round is about four minutes long, which coincidentally is the length of totality. So tell us, what is it like being on the track? You know what, the, uh, the sun plays a huge role in determining the performance of the car um, based on the track conditions. So we actually, when it's a day like this, as much as it's beautiful for the fans, it's actually very difficult for us as drivers because as the surface heats up, the oils come to the top of the asphalt and it actually becomes slippier. So that's surprising to people. They think the temperature would mean grip, but it, it is until a certain point. And then once it kind of crosses over 100 degrees on the surface, you start to actually go the other way. Wow, and tell me about those tires. How does the sun affect those? So when they're, so we use slick tires. So Firestone tires are slick. Um, on a road car, you have tread, right? Because they're so supposed to use in all conditions. Slick tires actually have a bigger contact patch, more surface area, so they generate more grip at a temperature, right? So they operate between 180 to 230 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, again, the sun is good until a point when they go over that 230 degree mark, you start to lose that grip again. Ooh, all right. Well, we have a little competition going on today. We're trying to determine whose big day is it? Is it the sun's, the moon's, or the earth? So my question to you is, are you team sun, team moon, or team earth? That's a, that's a hard one, but I'm going to go Team Earth. You know, I just think we're so lucky, especially today with the people that are around us here to be able to witness what we're about to see. Um, go Earth. Go Earth. You heard it here first. All right, guys, thanks. We'll be back here. Daryl in Niagara, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Lauren. Just 500 miles northeast of you. We are here at Niagara Falls, right next to the Niagara River. This is a special location for a lot of people because it is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see a natural wonder set against a celestial one, the solar eclipse. And so let's talk, first of all, about the natural wonder. And it all starts right here. Look at this massive river and the amount of water that's moving through here. A half million gallons of water, half a million bathtubs actually, going over the falls at every 60 seconds. It's tremendous, the flow here. It interacts with the air, it hits the rocks, and it also, you know, it flows up a mist column that is omnipresent. This is always here. So one of the things that eclipse watchers want to see is, how does it interact with the light? Well, we have a pink rainbow because only prominences from the sun will be seen and they're pink. We'll have to see about that. One thing we do need is a little bit better cloud uh, clearing around here because we do have some cloud cover. But that's okay, people who are gathered here are excited. 
and they're hopeful that it will clear. Who's here? Well, I want to show you our camera from about 500 feet away. Look at all my friendly eclipse watchers. Are you guys ready for an eclipse? Yeah! Whoa, I love the energy. We, we could use this energy to blow the clouds out of here. As our camera backs out, you're looking at Terrapin Point, and this is the lawn here. It's roughly the size of a football field, and everybody who's here, a lot of people came in at 6 a.m. this morning. They currently cut off the park from anybody from coming further into Goat Island here. So this is the max capacity that we're at right now. It's that popular. Over to the other side, our friends from Canada, look across the river gorge, about a thousand feet away. Niagara Parkway is lined with people. So it's beautiful shot over there. And we really appreciate our Canadian friends who have joined us. Now, this is our Canadian friends who have joined us. Now, this isn't just about the solar eclipse. We've been here for the past week, and we were at locations all across Niagara Falls, 12 to be exact. Take a look at this video. Crowds of people packed the Niagara State Park Welcome Center where Commander Munikin Campos, the mannequin who flew around the moon during the Artemis I test flight in 2022, was on display. Our partners at the Canadian Space Agency sent kids virtually to space all week long. And NASA experts from the Kennedy Space Center gave presentations and talks at places like the Niagara Aerospace Museum and libraries across the area. The outreach was a huge success with thousands of people participating in the events and passing through our exhibits. And we just want to thank everyone who came out to see us at all our locations and we hope you left a little inspired about space exploration and a little wiser about all NASA's missions. Okay, coming up, we've got a very special guest for you who's going to share the eclipse with us, CSA astronaut Jeremy Hansen. He's going around the star today, the moon. Not the star, the sun, the moon. <laughs> the star of the show, I should say. He's going to be here. He's interacting with the public. We're going to get his thoughts on totality along with everybody else who is here. And we're pumped and excited. Right, everybody? We ready for an eclipse? Yeah. Can you hear the excitement? All right, now I'm going to send it 800 miles to the northeast to my colleague Angelique Herring, who is in Holton, Maine, where I hear you have some pretty good weather. Hello, Daryl, and welcome everybody to Maine. That's right, we do have some great weather. We are here in Maine, and actually we're about three miles away from the Canadian border, and also about the last stop on I-95 North. So we're the northmost spot for today's eclipse broadcast, at least in the United States. And so hello from way up north. Now, just like Daryl said, we do have some excellent weather here in Maine today. We've been here for a couple of days and it's actually been pretty wintry right up until about yesterday. We had snow, it was pretty cold, but you know what? Today, the sun is out, the skies are blue, and it's looking like perfect conditions for an eclipse, or as the Mainers would say, wicked good weather. Now, we're actually standing here in Market Square in Maine, and we are outside of the Temple Theater, where it has actually been in operation since 1919. Over the last 150 years of its operation, it's seen everything from silent films to burlesque shows, and today, it's got a more celestial show with the eclipse. Now, the last eclipse to come through Maine was actually in 1963, and that eclipse was only visible for about a minute. In contrast, today's eclipse will be visible for at least just about three minutes or so, so everyone here is going to have a lot of time to take in the celestial show, really soak in the event. And the next eclipse won't be coming through Maine until 2079. So it makes a lot of sense that we've got a lot of people here really excited to see this once in a generation opportunity and event. We're all excited. I know everybody here is excited. So we'll be here waiting for the moment that we've all been waiting for, the eclipse. With that, back over to you, Megan. Hey, thank you everyone. It was really cool to see everyone along the path of totality. You can tell we're covering a large swath of land because everybody's in different kind of attire. <laughs> yes. You know, you have short sleeve shirts somewhere and then you have like Daryl who's <laughs> who it looks very, very cold and he does have some cloud cover. So I hope that it does kind of clear out for I him. Figure, I feel like we've covered all of those levels of weather over the last day and a that's half. That's true, here in, <laughs> here Cleveland, in Cleveland. So, But it's looking nice now, so that's great. And actually, if you uh, were watching our screen here, we just had uh, a view of the uh, eclipse in in uh, Mazatlan, Mexico, in about 10 minutes, that's when we'll start seeing totality in that area. And in that time, the U.S.'s top doctor is encouraging everyone to try and watch this celestial event for our physical and mental well-being.
Hi, everyone. I'm U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy. I'm thrilled to be joining you today as you gather to experience a truly awe-inspiring event, the last chance that we'll have to see a total solar eclipse in the contiguous United States for the next 20 years. The sun is a universal source of light and life. It contributes to our physical, mental, and emotional well-being, and it unites all of us. Today, no matter where you're watching from, whether it's along the path of totality or a partial solar eclipse, you are sharing the experience with millions across the nation. And moments of connectedness like this truly matter. Last year, I issued a Surgeon General's advisory warning about the public health crisis posed by loneliness and isolation. I share that our connection with one another is a powerful force that can help protect against the damaging physical and mental health impacts of loneliness. What better reason is there to come together with friends and loved ones than to share a once in a generation experience like the solar eclipse? This is an experience that will stay with you precisely because of the awe that it inspires. Awe allows us to step outside of ourselves, giving us fresh perspective and opening us up to connections. So grab your eclipse glasses and let's enjoy this moment together. Some great advice, thank you so much. All right, we have time for other hashtag eclipse questions. Sarah, are you ready? I am absolutely ready. All right, let's take a look at this video from a familiar face. Hey everyone, I'm Scarlett Johansson and I play a NASA public affairs director in the new film, Fly Me to the Moon. I hope everyone is safely enjoying today's eclipse. I actually have a question about the moon for NASA. So during a total solar eclipse, I've heard that craters and features on the moon play a role in what viewers see on Earth when the moon blocks the sun. So why is that? Question, Scarlett. So yeah, as we, you know, the moon isn't, isn't a smooth marble. It actually has big high mountains and, and valleys, these craters. And as we approach totality, sometimes you'll hear people talk about Bailey's beads. And these are the last few moments of sun creeping through those, those deep valleys yeah. uh, just before we hit totality. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. It's so great to have you here to answer some of these questions and we plan to take more. If you send them in, hashtag Eclipse again. Okay, if you're just joining us, I'm NASA's Megan Cruz, and this is NASA lunar scientist Sarah Noble. And as you can see, you are watching the official NASA broadcast for today's total solar eclipse. And we are in the heart of downtown Cleveland, where NASA is celebrating this celestial alignment. Take a look at our shot from the... Craft is safe. When it comes to aviation, uh, every
why are solar eclipses so uh, unique, such a unique opportunity to study our sun? Because you have the alignment of three celestial bodies and uh, unique things happen when that occurs. And it has a profound effect here on Earth. Just think about it, the middle of the day, all of a sudden it gets totally dark. And us earthlings are not accustomed to that and nor are the other little earthlings. That's right. All the animals, uh, but it's also an opportunity for us to study much more one of those celestial bodies and that's our star, our sun, and our star in our solar system. And we can find out more about that gaseous explosion that's coming out from the core of the sun when we can see it better. And we can see it better because we're not looking at the bright ball, you're suddenly looking at that corona, yep. that mass of gases that are coming out from the edge of the sun. Right. And you don't have to be a scientist, right, to, to, help to study this event, right? How do we get help from people across the country to help us study these things? Well, by asking them. <laughs> Make a note of anything that you observe and then share that with us. All right, an administrator, you know, we have to take precautions when viewing a solar eclipse. Remind everyone what should we should be doing today. Okay, you've got some glasses. That's right. Uh, That's right. The glasses are We're all ready. absolutely essential. Uh, you want to put these on as it is starting to have that moon move in front of the sun and uh, we don't want you to damage your eyes. Right. Yep. And uh, it's incredible. You put these glasses on in the normal sun of the day, you can't see a thing. Can't see a thing. But when you <laughs> yes. look at the sun, you will be protected. Administrator, Fantastic. thank you so much. We really appreciate your time here. And now we're going to head it back over to James at the Eclipse Board. Whew, yeah, the countdown is on. Just a few moments left until the eclipse makes landfall in Mazatlan, Mexico. Right here, you can see where that eclipse totality shadow is right here. It's going to continue moving very rapidly onwards to Torreon, where we also have a live feed covering all of this event. Super excited for that big moment. And let me actually just go to our moon board here, and we can play through this at 60 times speed. I'll zoom in a little bit here. And Scarlett Johansson had a question a bit earlier about the kind of rippling effect that we see of the eclipse shadow. When you first see this right here, at first glance, you might think it's low resolution or lacking some kind of information here. The inverse is actually true. This is actually incredibly high resolution, this shadow projection that we have because of data that we've been gathering at our moon for more than 10 years, thanks to an orbiter called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's been mapping our nearest neighbor in incredible resolution just really getting every single bit of valley or crater or mountain, all of those little imperfections on the moon are contributing to that shadow that we see rippling across the country. You're not gonna be able to see that from the ground, but looking from space, you see that really cool effect of kind of the rippling there here. So let's just preview some things to come here. Mazatlan, they have that last little crescent sliver of sun. For now, if you're in that area, make sure you keep your glasses on until that sun is completely blocked out by the moon. That's gonna be in just a few moments. You're gonna have a long duration there, four minutes and 17 seconds. That sounds like a lot of time, but it's gonna move like that. So make sure you are ready on the pulse. Again, for all of our locations up on this path of totality here too, make sure you set a timer on your watch or a phone or something to remind yourself to look outside and experience this. You don't wanna miss this. If you do miss it, you got a long time to wait for the next big one across America. That's gonna be in 2045. So make sure you're watching and watching safely here. You just saw some footage from Kerrville and Cleveland as well. It's a little bit cloudy in some places, really hoping that that clears out in time for us to have that beautiful view. But in just a few moments right here, this eclipse is gonna be coming up in Mazatlan, Mexico. So for now, this is gonna be really exciting. The countdown is on. So for Mazatlan, this is the last little bit here. Again, I'm always keeping an eye on that weather. And also one little note about our tool here too. If you wanted to see this little icon kind of previews what the uh, expected uh, eclipse is gonna look like at that given time. All these little googly eye features are clickable, hyperlinkable. You can kind of click on that. It'll snap you right to that exact time to get an idea for what it's gonna look like in your neck of the woods. But for now, the big moment's coming up. Back to you, Megan. Let's check it out.
All right, thank you, James. And as you can see, wow, we just have a tiny little faint sliver left of the sun in Mazatlan, Mexico. We are expecting totality in a minute and 35 seconds. You know, joining us now to walk us through this, Kelly Korak, an astrophysicist for NASA's Heliophysics Division. Kelly, tell us about the science NASA is about to conduct right now in Mazatlan. So science uh, that they're going to conduct is uh, about the WB-57. So we're going to fly some planes over and make sure that we can actually see that solar corona, that uh, that that hot atmosphere uh, that's around the sun that we're about to get once uh, we reach totality. Yeah, and it looks like uh, it's al almost there. Yes, it's almost there. Uh, you know, we have a view right now of inside the cockpit of one of the WB-57s, or at least we're efforting one, because as you said, this is going to be a huge part of what we do in Mazatlan. Definitely, yeah. It's the... Uh, th oh, it's there it is, Kelly. Oh, there, there it is. is. Oh, look at that view. So we're looking oh, out. that's great. We're looking out, and it looks like we might be able to... We're seeing a lot of clouds, but hopefully a shadow as well as we're coming in to totality there. Um, and so, yeah, so these WB-57s are carrying three different instruments or three different uh, experiments, two to look at the sun and one to look at our atmosphere because our atmosphere actually responds to the eclipse. And we're trying to figure out how that ionosphere, that layer of the atmosphere actually responds to it. And you said it does look like there's already a shadow over land you yes. know we also have a shot and we'd like to pull that up now a shot of the coast and the fact that it's already going on over and you know what's really cool about all of this is we do we do have eyes all over this thing because we are collecting so much data yeah definitely I mean we have the the stuff here we also have rockets on the other side of the country being launched to again study that oh look at that there's wow. the diamond the diamond ring that's yes. right Woo! <laughs> We're not there, but I feel the energy yeah, exactly. just watching it. Uh, yeah, so this is the because of the craters and the peaks and valleys and the moon, uh, we're seeing the last bits that are just getting through, and now we're oh, getting to wow. totality. Uh, this is great. So you're starting to see those pink fingers um, out there kind of sticking out. Wow. So again, totality here in Mazatlan, Mexico, the first community in North America to experience the moon completely eclipsing the sun. And if you are in Mazatlan right now, it is now safe to remove your eclipse glasses for the next four minutes. And you mentioned some of those pink filaments that we're seeing, right? Can you talk us a little bit through that, Kelly? Yeah, so those pink filaments, um, they're, because they're helium rich, that's why they're, they're appearing pink and they're, they're hanging out there. Those could be the start of space weather. So there are uh, lots of tons of material, billions of tons of material that could possibly be one of those explosions for space weather, the reasons why we really study the sun and try to understand how to live with the sun. Mm. Well, you can know. you explain why space weather is important to us here on Earth? Definitely. So it's not just satellites that need that uh, are are interested in space weather. It's also our power grids because of those energetic particles coming from those those uh, big explosions that can happen in the sun. Um, that could damage our power grids. It could uh, also uh, do things like interfere with GPS signals. And I know we all use our phones to navigate everywhere. Um, so if we didn't have that, that would be a big uh, big problem. So we're uh, looking to understand it better so we can all mitigate all those things. Some of the movement we're seeing here is just or telescope operator adjusting because again they needed to make some changes for before totality now they're viewing it a different way and then after totality we might see some shakes there as well but I really just cannot believe how how crisp it is as we said it's not a marble <laughs> but I mean just the view of it is so crisp with these little uh, again those filaments are just amazing that we can see that to, to such accuracy you know right definitely and also the fu the fu white fuzz I mean that's you're seeing something that's a million degrees just wow, hanging wow out all around the sun and you know three uh what is it three billion earths could fit inside of there so there's a <laughs> lot of there's a lot of atmosphere there um all around there just hanging out uh, being very warm and so how you know one of our mysteries is and one of the the b-57s are addressing there um, you go oh, wb-57 oh, our pilot yeah. Yeah. He's flying. So basically, Kelly, he is going to fly and try to, to, to chase down the shadow for as long as possible, keep up with it as long as possible. Exactly. The shadow is much faster than the plane. However, they can chase it for a while and get an extra two minutes. So uh, on the ground, we can only get four and a half minutes, and they're going to get six and a half for that plane. I love that they're waving they're to us. Oh, there you go. And now we're flipped. Now we're right. seeing the front. Right. So again, yeah. they are in night. I mean, yeah. it looks yeah. very dark with only some light on in, in the horizon, yeah? Right, yeah, and that's what we'll expect to uh, it, wherever we see totality is, is the night sky is very dark. You might even see some planets or stars. Um, and then you'll see like twilight all around at a 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. What an amazing vantage point as well. My gosh. Mm -hmm.
I'm very jealous. Kelly, are you jealous? I kind of feel I'm like you're jealous. I'm kind of a little jealous. <laughs> yeah, I kind of want to, you know, see if I can make a faster plane so we can, you know, right. follow well, it all the whole way. Plus, they're up above the clouds, so yes. they don't have to worry. Worry about the clouds, exactly. <laughs> well, I do want to say yeah. a big thank you to the WB57 pilots and the whole team supporting them for that great view. That was awesome. Kelly, you know, you have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the sun. And, and for those watching, if you're interested in learning more with her, check out her and other experts featured in the Sun series of NASA's Curious Universe podcast. And that QR code will pop up on the screen, screen, and that'll take you straight to the episodes. Again, look at that double box we got there. We're showing you amazing views during this broadcast. A big thank you, actually, to the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, or SERVI, for providing the telescope views from Mazatlan. Yeah, the survey team down there, the survey team is based out of Ames, but it is a collection of, of teams across the country and across the world that are sort of studying the, the intersection of science and exploration, helping us get ready for our next trip with humans to the moon. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, totality is actually about to end in Mazatlan. Let's keep watching our screen right now for, again, what are we watching for, Kelly? Uh, we're watching for the diamond ring effect. So that's when the first bright light, we're starting oh, to see it on this side there. Um, so you're going to put your glasses on right now to protect those beautiful eyes <laughs> um, because now we're going back to the partial phase. Whoa, so. wow. that's amazing. Wow. Kelly, that's a filter, by the way, everyone. That's why we're seeing yeah, that. Yeah, but yeah. when you said put on your glasses, I'm so trained now to do it that I, that I almost did it here in Cleveland. No, we're fine in Cleveland. We're still in Mazatlan. Again, what we're seeing is because we needed to adjust the filter now that, again, we are. It's basically like putting on our glasses. The way that you said people on the ground need to put on our glasses, our telescope operators need to protect their own eyes as well as their equipment. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. I really appreciate your time here with us. It was so fun to learn about the science and actually see the first eclipse come uh, for uh, North America here. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right, as you can see, there's a lot to learn about our sun and eclipses. So to explain it all in a really fun way for kids, NASA developed a clever game called Snap It. We have another QR code coming on your screen right now. Just scan that code, or if you're watching us on your phone, all you have to do is screen grab it, press on it later, and uh, you can check out that game. Also, the website, if that's easier for you, go.nasa.gov slash snapit. Okay, so NASA can predict the total solar eclipse's path to a high degree of accuracy because of a spacecraft that launched nearly 15 years ago. This same sp spacecraft is now helping our Artemis II astronauts who will be orbiting the moon next year. NASA's next step in establishing a long-term presence on the moon is sending four astronauts to fly around it with the Artemis II mission. Part of the crew's training has been to study images from NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO. The spacecraft launched in 2009 and continues to use seven instruments, including a high-resolution camera to help us learn more about the moon's surface. Because of LRO, we now know more about the moon's topography than any other planetary body in the solar system, including Earth. The Artemis II crew used LRO data and photographs to learn how to identify lunar landmarks they'll see from orbit and to seek out sites of scientific interest like possible landing spots for future explorers. While helpful for planning Artemis missions, people back here on Earth also use LRO to predict the shape of the moon's shadow or umbra during total solar eclipses. The moon's shadow will change throughout the eclipse depending on the lunar terrain and the elevations of observers on Earth. People may even see what looks like an arc of solar diamonds around the moon as sunlight peaks through lunar features like craters. That's a look at your Artemis Moon Minute. All right, joining us on the host desk now is a familiar face here. Oh, actually, we have, sorry, Snoopy. Oh, I just revealed that it's Snoopy. Well, I just want to <laughs> wave real quick to the crowd here at the Great Lakes Science Center just outside of our host desk, waving at us, waving at the camera. I'm waving back at them like they can see me. Uh, but I did just spoil the surprise. We do have Snoopy here, our chief uh, safety officer here at NASA, and he's here to tell us how to safely watch the eclipse. So, Snoopy, if we were to watch the eclipse today before to Totality, where should we what should we do? That's right, you should have your glasses on. That's right. <laughs> well, and what about during totality, Snoopy? Can we take them off then? Yeah, let me help you out here. 
Oh, Snoopy, there I can see your shining bright eyes. I love Snoopy, he's so funny. <laughs> now, Snoopy, I have to ask you a question, okay? So today we've been polling everybody, asking for the total solar eclipse today, who is the big star of the show, right? Is it the Earth? Is it the Earth? Is it the moon? It, is it the sun? Okay, but you have to pick but one. You have to pick one. You have to pick one. You don't, you don't no, want to pick all, one? All of them. <laughs> all, all of them. them. <laughs> all of them are great. Okay. That's right. <laughs> Subi, thank you so much. I know you're super excited to see the total solar eclipse today. We're glad to have you here. Bye. <laughs> all right, now let's head back over to Tahira in Kerrville, Texas. All right, thanks, Megan. I mean, what an incredible view from Mazatlan, Mexico. That was amazing. And folks, as you can see in your screen right now, we are less than one minute away from the eclipse crossing over Torreon, Mexico. Gina, how fast is this moon shadow moving right now? I mean, it's it's flying. It's going about 1,900 miles per hour as we're chasing it across the U.S. That is incredible. And so, you know, in Mazatlan, we were able to see the diamond ring effect. That's right. Some Bailey's that beautiful. Beads. So hopefully we'll be able to see that in, in Torreon right now. Yeah, we're watching that so, live feed. Yes, just to see this this sliver crossing over the moon. That's right. We're getting so close there. We hopefully are getting we'll see so that diamond close. ring too. Wow. Look at this. And so we're about 10 seconds All right. away. Here we go. Let's take it in. Wow. What a and spectacular going into totality. Wow. Oh, there, there you have go. it. We are in. Yep, that diamond it's ring came through. And we see a little bit of those Bailey beads, too, as we're looking at it. Those kind of the lights trickling through around the surface of the moon, coming through the, the peaks and valleys. So what is a, what are we viewing on the left-hand side? This this almost pink color effect. Right, and so as we just heard from the last totality, you know, these pink fingers wow. are popping out a little bit. <laughs> and those are those solar prominences. They're appearing pink because of the, the helium rich. Oh, but we can see it. Let's focus on the corona here, that glow that we're getting. And we can see basically these streams that are coming out, a lot of that energy and brightness that we do not have the ability to see on a day-to-day -day basis. So with this total eclipse, we're able to see that corona nice and bright coming through in Torreon. That is just a like magical view. Oh my goodness. It Gina. is. Gina, okay, and so let's take, we've got so many questions coming in online right now from awesome. viewers watching this. Our first one is gonna be from Justin, who wants to know, you know, right now we are seeing a pretty clear and spectacular view of oh, yeah. a total solar eclipse. Yes. But Justin wants to know, what will it look like if it's clouded over? Right, so the view that we're getting right now, you won't be able to see that if it's clouded over, but you will have effects going on, right? You'll get a change in the temperature, so the temperature will drop. It'll still get darker as it's well. It's already getting dark here yeah. in Kerrville. I mean, <laughs> we, we have some cloud coverage, right? Yeah. And we're feeling a little extra wind. It's noticeably darker despite the clouds that we have. So you'll get some of those environmental effects, even if it's cloudy where you are. And so a great follow-up, you know, we've got Halloween Ghoul on YouTube who wants to know, again, Will the temperature change during totality, which I know you mentioned that it will get a little bit cold, cooler, yes. but do you know about how many degrees we can expect? Yeah, you know, it depends on the location, the humidity, multiple factors, but it can change by about 10 degrees or so, depending where you are, maybe even a little bit more than that. And, you know, we're feeling a little chilly kind of where we're sitting compared to what it was earlier. And I mean, I'm just staring at this view of totality that we have right. in Torreon. So we're about halfway through totality right now in Torreon, Mexico. And again, I know folks said that this is almost double totality than 2017, right? That's right, that's right. And so in 2017, we had a little more than two minutes. So we're lucky enough this time that we have over four minutes in some places too. This is so beautiful. And so our next question from Sibel on Instagram wants to know why is the sun more active right now? Oh, so the sun is more active because we have an 11 year solar cycle. The sun goes from solar maximum to solar minimum where it's changing its level of activity. Oh, and as you're Are seeing the screen, yeah, so I see in that the bottom right there, we can see that prominence extending out. And as we heard earlier in Mazatlan, you know, that is potentially the beginning of space weather activity. So we're talking about solar maximum. If there's a time to see any of that space weather activity during the total solar eclipse, wow. this is the time to do it. So let's watch that as we go through totality in our other locations too, and maybe we'll be lucky to see some of these features change for us. That is so beautiful. It is. 
And so, Gina, too, you know, how um, we're in a we're in a higher cycle. Uh, solar cycle right now. How many years, you know, is that fluctuation? Right. The, the solar cycle goes on for 11 years when it peaks in activity, and that's where we are, where the latest predictions are, are that we will reach that wow. maximum sometime this year, and then it'll decrease in activity going back down to solar minimum. And so, Gina, I've got time for one more quick question from Christopher on X, who wants to know which other planets have the best eclipses. Oh, okay, well, that's right. So eclipses don't only happen on Earth. Let's talk about Mars for the fact that Mars does have eclipses when the moon crosses in front of Mars. Mars has two moons, and the, the rovers on the surface have captured images of those. But no other planet has a view quite like this, right? Nope, that is special for us. Just the distance and the size of the moon makes it such that it will completely block the sun as it's doing today. Wow. And you wow. can see there's that diamond ring effect as we are coming out of totality in Torion. What an incredible wow, it's a bright one, view. too. Look that at that. That is a bright one. And so is this a, this is what, a Bailey's bead? Or? So that, that's going to be that diamond ring, just how bright it is. Bailey beads are a little bit smaller as they kind of bubble over the surface, but folks who are in that location should have those safety viewing glasses back on so that they can now view the partial eclipse that they are experiencing. Well, that is fantastic. And you know, the next time we see this eclipse, it's going to be right here in Kerrville, Texas. So folks, the countdown is on. We've got about 10 minutes until we we see this That's with our right. own eyes. You can hear people in, Yes, big <laughs> moment right here in Kerrville. For now, let's check back in with Lauren at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Thanks, Tahira. We are getting close to Eclipse ourselves, but for now, we have a very special guest, NASA's very own Pam Melroy, Deputy Administrator and former astronaut. Pam, it's good to see you. Oh, it's great to be here. I'm so excited. It's very exciting. So what's it like being in Indianapolis for an exciting event like this? <laughs> well, it's a beautiful day here. And I love the fact that we're here with thousands of people in the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But we're joining with millions of people around America looking up together to the sky. Absolutely. And tell me, is this your first eclipse? It's not my first eclipse, but it will be my first totality. Oh. I've seen several partial eclipses, but there's something mystical and mysterious and in some ways unifying about a total eclipse. And we're all going to feel it together. Absolutely. We could not have lucked out more on this weather today. So as a former astronaut, we know that sun science and space weather are very important to keeping our astronauts safe. What is um, space weather and why do we care about it? What is NASA doing to study it? Yeah, that's right. It's actually very important. It is of concern for astronauts who are in space because they experience the radiation of the sun that comes from solar flares and solar weather. But the reality is it's also affecting life here on Earth. It impacts the upper reaches of our atmosphere called the ionosphere, which is an electrified part of our atmosphere that is a conduit for communications. Um, it's, it's critically important. It can even affect power grids. And of course, if you ever have seen the Northern Lights, you've seen the effect of solar weather. So, but really the focus for today is where that solar weather starts. And that's in the corona, the sun's atmosphere. It's very unusual and we don't exactly know what's happening because the sun's atmosphere is millions of degrees hotter than the surface of the sun. So we are hoping to learn today more about how that happens and why that happens so that we can better predict those solar flares and those things that impact us here on Earth. Yeah, that's all extremely important.
it's an honor to have you here. Thank you. The crowd noise, like right. the fact that the sun is behind the clouds most of the time and peeking out. This is, it's so yes, wonderful. It's I know. True. Thanks for being here. You can As hear you can that. hear, like we are ready. <laughs> we are right this there. Is so exciting. <laughs> So tell us, Reed, you know, obviously everybody is excited, but have you seen a total of solar eclipse before? Never a total, so I will share this darkness oh, with you. Same. The whole crowd the first time. Oh my wow, God. this is really incredible. That's so, too, you know, what considerations do you and your fellow Artemis astronauts need to think about when related to the sun when traveling back to the moon? Well, it's great to see uh, Pam Melroy on your last clip, uh, a dear friend of mine, so it was nice to see Pam's face over there. But when we're heading out to the sun, it's really radiation is our big mm. thing that we're, th I'm sorry, as we're heading out to the moon, yeah. it's really <laughs> the, the solar sun. radiation yeah. that we're most thinking about there as the danger from from the sun and the Apollo astronauts dealt with it and we've dealt with it for a long time on the International Space Station and we have a lot of data from the moon from our, our NASA probes that have gone out there and collected so we think we know what we'll encounter. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. And tell me, Reed, how does it feel to be the commander of NASA's first crewed mission going back to the moon Incredible. since Apollo? I'm flying with Victor Glover, Christina Cook, and Jeremy Hansen, the three wow. best. Team, yes. I know, so every day that I go into work, I won't say every day is easy, but every day is fun, and I'm flying with people that have principles, they have integrity, and they have just so much knowledge and professionalism. It's a dream come true. And getting to work with the whole team, the international team, uh, it's the best. Wow. Well, thank you so much for being here with us, Reed. You know, really quickly, do you have any advice for anybody that might want to follow in your footsteps one day? Uh, we always say that you have to find that job that you love, go all in on it, live your best life, be as good of a professional as you can, and someday apply for the program. And we look forward to seeing your application come across our desk. Thank awesome. you, Reed, and good luck on thank your you. upcoming thank mission. You. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, if anybody feels like reaching for the stars, NASA is actually currently accepting applications to be an astronaut. You could one day travel to the moon and eventually to Mars. From teachers to scientists to even those in our armed forces, we are looking for a diverse
from our range safety officer to our ROA, range operations, and then on to launch control, who will make the settings at the launcher you see on the screen out at the launch pad on Wallops Island. This, of course, is uh, goes through uh, safety scrutiny review to make sure that uh, we avoid any hazards and remain within the hazard area dictated by our range safety officer. We are now at four minutes and counting. Copy that, check 425. And if you're just joining us, we just passed three minutes and counting for our first rocket launch today from Wallops Island, Virginia, as part of the atmospheric perturbations around the eclipse path or APEP mission. Much easier to say APEP. I'll say that from here forward. APEP launch here from the MRL launcher on Wallops Island range. We will have uh, three rocket launches today. MRL will be our first launcher, which is the closest to you looking our left on the left of the screen. The ARC will be our second launcher, which is not on screen currently. And then our third launch will be from our 50K launcher, which is currently on the right of screen that we're seeing now. Again, the APEP mission here during the eclipse to study disturbances in the ionosphere with our PI, Dr. Aro Perjadia, here from Embry-Riddle. We also have other uh, co-PIs in this mission that we'll talk about after this first launch. We are now at two minutes and counting. Mark. PTM check 434. PLC check 435. Actual launcher settings are azimuth 100.4, elevation 79.2. Copy that LC check 436. ACS check 437. Experiment, you go. Experiment, go. PLC. PLC, go. PTM. Go. STM. Go. ACS. Go. PI. Go. SRPO. Go. Check 438-439. One minute. SPLC check 441, go. Fifty seconds. Minus 40. Minus 30. Arm verified. Check item 445. Minus 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, check 4, 4, 15, 7, go. 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, mark, T0. And our first APEP rocket has left the rail. Let's listen in. Mission squid. Motor pressure. Plus 20. All TM antennas tracking. Plus 
plus 30. Here's now a look inside our RCC. It's the range team. Plus 40. As well as sounding rockets, our PI, Dr. Bajati is also in the room. All now observing the data on the screens in front plus of them. 50. As we have launched squib, our minute. first rocket Separation of a three-rocket salvo today from Wallace Island, it's part of the APEP mission. ACS-1. Swarm ACS door squib, target. eject squib, got all plunger switches and brake wires, aft skirt squib. Good luck on all four swarm, all are transmitting at high power. ACS-2 on target. Boom, squib. Looks like all four booms extended. Looks like the zero degree boom did not deploy. Okay, we've passed two minutes, 40 seconds in flight for our first launch the MR, MRL launcher here at Wallace Flight Facility in support of the APEP launches. So thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. Uh, just some information, some background on the on the three rocket salvo we'll be doing here today. Each rocket will deploy. You'll hear some of the chatter on the range networks. Each rocket is uh, planning to deploy sub payloads about the size of a two liter bottle of soda. Each rocket essentially creates five suborbital profiles providing 15 different data sets from just three rockets. So that's all the data we're going to get from three launches today here at Wallops. The uh, atmospheric and ionospheric perturbations can happen at any time and place. But why we like the eclipse or why scientists like the eclipse, not including myself in that group of folks, most science campaigns have a two to three week window with eclipses. We, they know exactly when this dynamic is going to happen, allowing science teams to craft an easy and comprehensive experiment to study the basic physics that uh, would take them weeks, as said before. Again, this is the APEP TDR, mission. So does LPM. Are we clear to go outside just to check for any gross hazards? We're listening now to the LPM request right, permission. Yeah, you're we clear. Go out to the pad. Copy that. From the test director, just going to check around, make sure there's no hazards, obvious hazards around the pad, safe the pad, and then we'll get ready to move on to our next rocket from our ARC launcher, which will be not on camera yet. They'll swing cameras around for a good view of that launch. And that one is slated for a 3.20, 15.20 p.m. On the, here on the Eastern time. For rocket number two. Right now we're going to share a, a video, the Eclipse Explainer video. So enjoy. On April 8th, 2024, portions of the United States will get to enjoy the sight of a total solar eclipse. The last time this took place was back in August of 2017. So this is a good time to refresh our memory as to what's going to happen, why it occurs, and let you know where you can watch the show in the sky. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon moves between the Earth and the sun.
inside the narrow. Uh, thanks, Jamie, for that video. Make, make me, I didn't have to say penumbral or autumbral. It explained the shadows there. That was very good. I enjoyed that video. Education. Welcome back. Uh, we are here at Wallace Flight Facility in support of the APET mission from NASA Wallace Flight Facility in Virginia. Uh, during this mission, we're going to launch three identical sounding rockets. We've already launched one. Um, this is going to study how the sudden drop in sunlight affects our up, upper atmosphere. The mission, known as Atmospheric Perturbations Around the Eclipse Path, or APEP, is led by our PI, Dr. Raro Brajadia. He's a professor of engineering physics at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida, and his research team is no stranger to wallops. They've had mission launch from this site as recently as August of 2022. That mission was named SPEED, also an acronym, SPEED DEMON, tested technology that will be used on today's mission. But not only the team is no stranger to launching at Wallops, the payload that's being launched today has already successfully flown on a Wallops rocket. The same set of experiments were launched during the annular eclipse on October 14th in 2023 from the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. APEP is designed to measure changes in the ionosphere during the solar eclipses using instruments such as Langmuir probes, electric field probes, magnetometers, ionization gauges, and accelerometers. Simultaneous multi-point measurements will be achieved by ejecting four instrumented deployables from each payload or swarm. Springs are used to deploy the ejectables at a velocity of three meters per second, and they will take data for about seven to eight minutes. This is allo allows taking measurements in a larger volume of space. So in the T plus or in the in the T plus count, you heard a lot of chatter going on about ejecting uh, things from the vehicle. Yeah. When you, um, that's what that was discussing. Uh, Listen in now to range. T zero is so I can put it out to the our external partners. Copy, stand by. And you asked, you heard the TD asking for our next targeted T zero, which we have as three twenty p.m. here local on in, in, on the East Coast, eighteen forty Zulu or GMT. For those listening outside of the Eastern Seaboard, we now have our camera. Zoomed in on an ARC Hello launcher. This will be the next launcher for the next yeah. rocket Hello launcher. Us. On all assets. TD is SRPO. Go for TD. Uh, we're targeting the nominal T0 for the second one of 1520. MNO DPM. MNO. So as you just heard, we're sticking with the originally targeted 1520 or 320 p.m. Eastern Time T0 for the second rocket in the APEP mission. Let's listen in to range control. Go for TD. I'm going to let the B clock roll and then um, fire the next vehicle on the A clock if that's okay. To me. DPM, MNO. Go ahead. Yes, I am. Recorders are stopped. Thank you, sir. Check MM is the PM. Far away RSO. Go ahead. Vehicle performed nominally. Nominally, check item 454. Copy that. And TM and SRPO, I'm gonna go put the clock at T minus 15 without objection. SRPO concurs. 
The PM concurs. I just want to keep the B clock rolling for safety's reasons. Copy. Programmer, A clock at T minus 15 minutes of holding, please. Roger, 15 and holding. LPM, do you need to um, align cameras again? That's affirmed. We'll send them out now. All right. Good. Got our coordinates. RC, ROA. Uh, not necessary. This is RC. Go ahead. It's not necessary. You don't need it. LPM, TD, you don't need RF avoidance. Uh, that's a firm. We do not need RF avoidance. Copy. As you can see, we're taking a peek back into the RCC now, Range Control Center. As we've reset the clock to 15 minutes in holding, so they'll pick that up when we get closer to the terminal count for our second rocket launch today from Bob's Flight Facility targeting a 320 local departure from the rail. We're about, let's call it 27 minutes away from our second launch. Uh, just an overview of the rockets being used today. The vehicles for this scientific endeavor are Black Brant 9s, which are specifically designed for high altitude research. These rockets will soar to altitudes of up to 350 kilometers or 270 miles each, standing at an impressive 53 feet. Let's listen in now for a science update we have coming across the RCC feed. And programmer TD. This programmer, go ahead. Why don't you just set us up for a 1920 T0? Roger, can do. As you can see there at the bottom of the screen, our PI and Dr. Rajadia conferring with his science team. We're trying, we're waiting now for a science update, closely listening to the range feed to see if we have satisfaction on deployment of these sub payloads from the first rocket that launched from Wallops just 24 minutes ago. Let's listen in. One, two, three, four, five. While we wait for our PI and some, uh, some science updates, back to the rockets. The Black Brant 9s are a two-stage rocket, which means they have two separate engines to fire in sequence to reach higher altitudes. That first stage is powered by a Terrier motor and will thrust the rocket, while the second stage uses the Black Brant motor. Both motors are powered by solid fuel, which will burn quickly, meaning this will be a very fast rocket. So as you saw from our first launch today, if you look away, you're going to miss it coming off the rail. Make sure we pay attention. It doesn't climb much like the Antares rockets that launch here to resupply the ISS. The uh, sounding rockets are typically used to gather information about a specific phenomena or to test new technologies or instruments in a space-like environment. As we said earlier, we're getting right to the edge of space in the ionosphere today with these rockets, and they are uh, fast off the rail. Step back in with the range feed.
continuing more information about these sounding rockets. As we said, we get right to the edge of space, a space-like environment with a sounding rocket. They're not designed to reach orbit or stay in space for an extended period of time. They're designed to reach suborbital al altitudes, typically between 50 and 1,500 kilometers above the Earth's surface before returning to the ground. Today's rockets are expected to reach a maximum altitude of 340 kilometers. These rockets are provided and built and integrated with the payloads on board as part of NASA's Sounding Rockets Program, coordinated by the Sounding Rockets Program Office, or SRPO, located right here, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center's Wallops Flight Facility. The Sounding Rocket Program Office plays a crucial role in providing suborbital launch vehicles, payload development, and field operations support for NASA and other government agencies across the globe, not just here at Wallops. They work hand-in-hand -hand with the Sounding Rocket user community, offering launch opportunities that span a wide range of science applications. The partnership with SRPO enables these rocket launches to contribute to NASA's strategic vision and goals in Earth science, heliophysics, and astrophysics. The annual suborbital missions, approximately 20 of them, not only provide researchers with unparalleled opportunities for scientific research, but also allow the testing and development of new instrument and sensor concepts. These rockets are, of course, more than just instruments of research. They are a training ground for the next generation of space scientists. The short mission life cycle, coupled with hands-on instrument design and integration, ensures that future scientists receive the training and experience necessary for NASA's larger, more complex space science missions. It's a platform that stimulates innovation, technology, maturation, and rapid responses to scientific events. And it looks like our camera is back on our next launcher. All right. Yeah, we're ready for our next launcher, which will be the ARC. And we're still targeting that 1920 Zulu or GMT time, which will be a 320 local here on the East Coast for our second rocket in the APEP launch campaign, a three rocket salvo launching today from NASA's Wallops Flight Facility. Go ahead. All right, so we looked at the main payload data so far. It looks like um, all the booms did deploy, um, and the data does look pretty good. Uh, there are some squibbles uh, on the accelerometer on the main payload that we seem to be seeing. Uh, we'll have to look more into that as to what that um, sporadic squibbles on the accelerometer are. Uh, we are still looking at the data of the ejectables, but it looks like all of them came out. And uh, at first look, the coning looked smaller, uh, which is very good. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, as such, all the main payload instruments work great. Uh, signals looked better than what we had seen during Vismer. So all that's good, and I'll keep you posted as we analyze the sub-payload data more. Over. So we just heard from our PI, Dr. Arro Brajadia, and his uh, science update. It all sounds optimistic. Good data set coming in from our first launch of three here at Wallace Flight Facility. Uh, we've had some questions come online we wanted to address. Can, uh, can I see the rocket contrails with my Eclipse glasses on? Uh, so no, you won't be able to see the rocket's contrail in the sky with your Eclipse glasses on. As long as you aren't looking directly at the sun... You can remove your glasses and look at the rocket and the rocket contrail. Again, do not look directly in the sun. This day or any day, especially today, right? We don't look directly in the sun. I had to tell my mother that today via text. She asked me, if I wear my glasses, can I look at the sun? And I said, did you get uh, eclipse glasses? She goes, no, my prescription glasses. Said, no, mom, please don't wear those. Don't wear eclipse glasses. We now have a video we're going to share with you on how to safely observe a solar eclipse.
our eclipse today. I'm sorry. Great video. Thank you. Thank you to my sister. <laughs> Uh, another great video to explain some safety as we addressed earlier. Uh, yeah, if you're looking to see the rockets uh, in flight, the contrails in flight, uh, obviously, if you're looking away from the sun, uh, you can remove your glasses and look for the rockets and observe the contrails in the sky. Do not look directly at the sun, even though it's obscured. It's still very powerful, if not more. So, and uh, it will uh, do damage to your eyes. So do not remove your glasses looking directly into the sun. Uh, but uh, away from them, you can try to catch the rockets and their contrails in flight. On camera now is our next launcher, the ARC from Wallace Flight Facility. We have launched one. Welcome back. We've launched one of three rockets as part of a three rocket salvo today from Wallace Flight Facility. Uh, we are approaching, we just passed 13 minutes, one, three minutes and counting for our second rocket launch as part of the APEP mission or atmospheric perturbations around the eclipse path. Uh, today, of course, many people across the United States here in North America, from Texas to Maine, will be treated to a stunning astronomical event, a total solar eclipse. The moon will cross in front of the sun, block the, the light from our star, darkening the skies for those in the path of totality, and many people outside the path will see a partial eclipse. We here in the Virginia Wallops region are going to get about an 81% uh, totality around peak Totality time, which is 1530-ish, 330? 322 will be the most we'll see at 81% here in the Wallops region. Uh, this mission is led by Dr. Aro Berjadia from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, is in a, aiming to study how the sudden reduction in sunlight during the eclipse affects our upper atmosphere or ionosphere. We just passed 12 minutes and counting for our second launch. In the APEP mission, you can see the ARC launcher here. We've done station checks are complete. We're awaiting final uh, launcher settings that we'll get the ROA will uh, request from the RSO. And after the RSO safety analysis, they will pass on the final settings. ROA will then pass those to LC, you'll hear uh, as an acronym for launch control out at the pad, and they will adjust the rail with the, with the vehicle on board and we will be set to go for the second launch in our three rocket salvo as part of the APEP mission from Wallace Flight Facility today during the total solar eclipse. Terminal K in five, four, three, two, one, mark. Ten minutes and counting. ACS check 473474. TDRSO, this is PM on channel one. Um, PI wants to hold at T minus three minutes. Do you copy? Copy. Do you have an idea for how long he's going to want to hold? Because I might need to get some more balloons up in the air. PLC check 470. The intent is to hold for not more than five minutes. Would you need another balloon? So no more than five minutes hold? Is that my understanding? We're going to hold at three minutes for no more than five minutes and pick it up. Copy. I think we'll be okay. Copy. Programmer, when we get to three minutes, if you would hold. Yes, yes programmer. 
PLC check 471 and 472. Program is cheating. We're going to hold at uh, T minus three minutes. Roger, copy. Hold at three. We're going to pick it up no later than five minutes from that. Roger, I'll wait your word, sir. RC, DPN. This is RC, go. Request interrogation of transponder. In the work. Check 475, MNO, DPM. MNO. Record RF parameters and report TM lock. RF okay, as we just heard, uh, the, the PI has requested a hold. It's uh, T minus three minutes. We're passing eight minutes now and counting. Once we get to three minutes, we're going to hold no longer than five minutes. Uh, our assumption is the PI is waiting on something he wants to see uh, in the science realm. So we'll wait, that would put us to 322, and then plus the three we're holding would be a new T0 around 325 local here, uh, Eastern time. Or earlier, right? They could pick it up. So we've got the live feed on. We will hear five minutes would have been the max. So max T0, the latest would be 325. It could be earlier. But uh, we're all listening in uh, with wanting ears as we approach uh, totality here at uh, 322 local in the Wallops, Virginia area. And we will hold at T minus three minutes. We are coming up on seven minutes now and counting. We will hold for no longer than five minutes. Let's listen back to range control. There'll be a lot of chatter here now as we are in the terminal count and uh, all folks are providing inputs. m and DPM. m and Confirm good lock on swarms. Stand by. STM check 485. DPM, MNO, I can confirm that readout has a lock on all four swarms. Fixed TM has a lock on one through three swarms. EXP check 486, good swarm data. Copy, MNO check 484. SPLC check 487. RSO, ROA. This is RSO, go ahead. Provide final wind weighted settings for ARC. Final wind weighted settings are as follows Azimuth 100.9, elevation 79.3. Azimuth 100.9, elevation 79.3. Good read back. As we just heard, we got our final wind weighted settings uh, for our launcher from the RSO to the ROA. She will pass that on to the launch control out on the island and they will set the, the launcher. We're passing T minus five minutes now, expecting a hold around three minutes. Just some of information on the payload as we talked about earlier. To capture a wide variety of data, these rockets are using technology that was developed and proven right here at NASA's Wallace Flight Facility. The swarm communications technology will release four sub payloads that are carrying scientific instruments that will measure changes in electric and magnetic fields, density, and of course, temperature. The swarm canisters act like additional rockets with their own telemetry and scientific instruments, and each rocket will carry four swarm canisters, which you can picture as a similar size and shape as a metal coffee thermos or a two liter bottle of soda. By ejecting multiple sub payloads away from the main payload, the science team can collect additional valuable data. Each canister streams its unique telemetry and science data using onboard radios through the host rocket's communication system to the ground. Each rocket is carrying an identical set of four sub payloads in the form of swarm capsules. Three of the swarm capsules contain instruments built by a team from Embry-Riddle and the fourth swarm capsule was built by researchers from Dartmouth College up in New Hampshire. SWARM is not an acronym. One of the challenges when designing a rocket payload is making sure it's properly protected during launch. When rockets experience extreme heat, pressure, and vibrations during the launch, so payloads must be designed to withstand these conditions and the rigor they're about to be put through. The payload skin that contains the scientific instruments for this rocket 
was designed, built, and tested by the Sounding Rockets Program Office right here at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. We are at three minutes, 35 seconds and counting, expecting a hold at three minutes, which would be no longer than five minutes. So our latest T0 would be 325 local, 1925 uh, GMT or Zulu time. We're coming up now on three minutes, 15 seconds, and we'll expect a hold. Let's listen in to range audio. Three minutes and holding. PI, this is SRPO. Go ahead, SRPO. Uh, let us know when you want to pick up the count. Sounds like a plan. So it's best if we don't just try to pick it up right away. If we can announce a, a time that says this is the time we're going to start if we can. Current plan still is to pick up the count at 322, which is which would be the five-minute hold from 17 to 20. That's the current plan. TD, the planned new T0 is 1525. Do you copy? 1525. Program work copies as well, TD. RSO, do you copy? So as we just heard, uh, SRPO pulled, pulled the PI, who is our principal investigator, that's Dr. Brajadia, and he wishes to go to the end of the window, five minutes uh, as the maximum hold they had indicated earlier. So we will go to that, putting our new T0 at 325 p.m. local and uh, 1925 GMT. Or Zulu time. I want to take this chance to talk about some of the teams that are involved in this uh, in, in this uh, launch salvo here from Wallops. Instruments on board the rocket were built by uh, students and uh, faculty members from Embry Riddle, Dartmouth College in New Hampshire as well. A host of ground based observations are going on throughout the nation today, and they're also going to support this mission. Uh, Co investigators from the Massachusetts Institute of Technologies, Haystack Observatory in Westford, Massachusetts will run their radar to measure ionospheric perturbations farther away from the eclipse path. And uh, as well, a team of students from Embry-Riddle down in Florida will deploy high altitude balloons reaching 100,000 feet every 20 minutes to measure weather changes as the eclipse passes by. All of these measurements will aid ionosphere modeling efforts led by scientists at the University of Colorado Boulder and Embry-Riddle. Those are the teams involved in the science portion here. Of course, we spoke about our SRPO, our Sounding Rockets Program Office here at Wallops. We also have Wallops range personnel involved from project managers to test directors, launch pad managers, OCOM team, all the folks involved. Uh, range safety, we have range safety officers. We have surveillance of hazard areas, a uh, whole department within the range surveils offshore and in the general vicinity. vicinity. Uh, to make sure that we keep the public aviation and our mariners safe from anything we're doing in regards to the launch. Again, our cameras are fixed back on our next launcher, the ARC launcher, which is a rail launcher. Our, we, we do have our final settings. We're still at three minutes and holding and about, call it five minutes, from T0 once we pick up the count. 1525 is confirmed for our next T0. So let's listen in at range control.
out stations, if you're looking at the monitor straight ahead of us, looks like we got individuals that are on the hook that shouldn't be. RSO is uh, looking at it to determine whether we're green or red at this time. Three minutes. Jordan, can you zoom in? You can see how many people are in there. Zoom in on, on which camera? Flare. Stand by. MM. Go ahead. MM, is that RPO? Are you guys picking up? Yep. PLC check 491. So we need to know whether you're going to hold us or not. I think we're okay, TD. I'm just getting a, we're given a baseline number of people we see, getting the sub C value and making sure we're below our, our fixed values. Copy. PLC check 492. KCS check 493. DP, M&O, DPM. m Report TM lock and verify no change in TM signal strength. Stand by. RC, DPM. RC, go. TDR, so we are with some values. PTM check 499. RC, confirm no change. PLC check 497, 498, no 500. DPM, m &O, report TM lock and verify no change. LC, ACS, do you have final launcher settings? Yes, I was waiting check for the next to calm down. Actual launcher settings are... Actual launcher settings are as 100.9, elevation 79.3. Copy, LC. SPLC check 506, go. KCS check 502. Experiment, you go. Experiment, go. PLC. PLC, go. PTM. Go. STM. Go. ACS. Go. PI. Go, go, go. SRPO. Go. Check 503, 504. Ready. Arming verified. Check item 510. 20. ACS check 512. Go. Five, four, three, two, one. Mark. Radar subtracting. Ignition squib, motor pressure. Success, and our second vehicle has left the rail of the ARC Radar launcher here, live booster. from Wallace Flight Facility in Virginia. As part of the APEP launches, a three rocket salvo that uh, NASA Wallace Flight Facility is launching today in conjunction with Dr. Aro Berjadia, from the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Florida. APEP, of course, is an acronym. Uh, atmospheric perturbations around the eclipse path. We are launching three rockets today, four sub payloads on each, for a total of uh, 12 uh, different data sets that will be collected today and uh, back to the universities and academia for Peace study in our ionosphere. Let's listen in as we're in the plus count and we take a look in the RCC Bottom of the screen ACS center one. is our PI, Dr. Brajadia, and his science team. Swarm squib, all plunger switches. Eject squib, all brake wires. ACS one complete. Half skirt squib and brake wire. STM has lock on all Dallas units. All are transmitting at high power. 
We had Splash on the booster. SES-2 aligned and complete. I show all six potentiometers, show booms deployed. As far as micro switches, I got all except for the zero degree micro switch. PD, RSO, this LPM, can we uh, check outside for gross hazards? So you good with that? RSO is good with that. We're at plus two minutes. We're good. As we approach five minutes in flight for our second vehicle launch here from uh, Wallace Flight Facility today as part of the APEP mission, uh, we can go. I wanted to discuss one more time about the mission that is at hand here. We have one launch left of three, known as the Atmospheric Perturbations Around the Eclipse Path, or APEP, led by our PI, Dr. Aro Berjadia, a professor of engineering physics at Embry Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. This research team is no stranger to Wallops and had a mission launch from this site as recently as August 2022. 20, that mission named Speed Demon tested technology that will be used on today's mission. Not only is the team no stranger to launching at Wallops, but the payload that's being launched today has already successfully flown from right here on a Wallops rocket, courtesy of our sounding rocket program office. The same set of experiments were launched during the annular eclipse on October 14th, 2023 from the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. We're now approaching six minutes in flight and we'll listen in to range control for an update on the next launch, which is slated for a T0 of 4.05 p.m. Eastern time or 16.05. SRPO, TD, do you have an estimated next T0? Stand by.
TD, SRPO. Crow for TD. Uh, we're currently targeting a new non LT0 of 1615, uh, but the PIs continue to assess. Copy. When do you want to make that decision, SRPO? You want to push through the same way we did last time or hold earlier? TDCPM, uh, we're going to conduct the same plan we did last time, um, shifting the zero fifteen fifteen with a hold at T minus three to get there. Do you concur? Concurs. RSO, do you copy? RSO copies, sixteen fifteen. LOS for TM assets. Uh, PTM, this is PI. LOS, all radars. Did you call STMPI? I called PTM to see if he can uh, replay us the data. I'm setting it up now. 
Excellent, thanks. PI, PTM. Go ahead, PTM. Should be playing back. Let me know if you see something. Yes, we are seeing data. What time is this? Is it before launch or at launch? Uh, it's about 40 seconds before launch. Okay. We are getting data. And MNO, do we have uh, TMLOS? Yes, sir. I called out TMLOS at 1936. Copy. And did we stop recorders? Yes, sir. Copy. Okay, programmer, set us up for 2015 T0. Roger, set up 2015. Our way, RSO. Go ahead. Vehicle performed nominally. Check item 519. Copy that. SRPO, any reason to take measurements? Uh, negative. They can go ahead and de elevate the ARC. Copy. PM, you copy? PM copies. LC, TD, the launcher is yours. LC copies. And RSO TD on one. This RSO, go ahead. Do you care for a quick discussion with SC on channel five about these three people? I think that'd be a great idea. Let me change my headset better. Okay, RSO and SC, let's go to channel five, please.
And welcome back, and thanks again for joining us for the uh, broadcast of the APEP mission, three rocket salvo from here at Wallops Flight Facility. Camera is now zeroed in on our final launcher, the 50K launcher, which will be our final of the three rocket launch event today. We just passed 32 minutes and counting for the final rocket. Let me go over some uh, 10 things to know about the ionosphere. I dug up from science.nasa.gov. Uh, in case you didn't know, the last total eclipse that we had visible here from North America was uh, in 2017. And the next total solar eclipse that will be visible from North America will not happen until the year 2044. So we're going to have a while to wait for our next one. That's why our PI, Dr. Brajati, is very excited about the data set he's going to get collected from this event here at Wallops today and the launch of three rockets into the ionosphere. Um, some things about the ionosphere, it's a home to all the charged particles in the Earth's atmosphere. Earth's ionosphere overlaps the top of the atmosphere and the very beginning of space. So we're right on the edge of space as we enter into the ionosphere. The sun cooks gases there until they lose an electron or two, which creates a sea of electrically charged particles. The ionosphere is also where Earth's atmosphere meets space. It stretches roughly 50 to 400 miles above the Earth's surface, right at the edge of space. Along with the neutral upper atmosphere, the ionosphere forms the boundary between Earth's lower atmosphere, where we live and breathe, and the vacuum that is space. MM check, five, two, one. We hear him checking through the, the countdown right now. It's at five, two, one, and our total count for the three rockets today. Uh, sometimes five, two, zero. the ionosphere changes, and sometimes Coming. it's unpredictable. The ionosphere is constantly changing because it's formed when particles are ionized by the sun's energy, and the ionosphere changes from Earth's day side to night side. When the night falls, the ionosphere thins out as previously ion ionized well, particles relax and recombine back into neutral Copy particles. That, That's why the eclipse is of interest to our PI, because this is all happening inside of a very short window where they can target the science with their vehicles and sub payloads that are deployed. We are now we just past T minus 30 minutes and Go counting ahead, for our final Three launch. Let's listen into range control. Uh, that's a firm in work. ROA, just checking. Did we already get RF avoidance? You didn't need it the last time. Copy. Do you need RF avoidance of this one? Is... Uh, no, that's a negative. Do not need it. Copy. the off console for five minutes.
ROA LPM. Go ahead. Check items 523 and 524. Pad 2 is clear. Copy that. I'm an OSPM. Can you verify that radar is on and operational? Confirm. Copy. Check 525. TDs PM, um, we're a bit early, but I'd like to request your permission to move into terminal count. I have no objections to that. PI, PTM. Go ahead, PTM. That's it for the playback. Is that good? That is good. Thank you. I'm still looking at the data. I will report back in a minute.
Okay, SRPO, MM, PTM, uh, giving a little update. Go for PI. All right, so yeah, on this one again, it looks like all the booms came out. I see where Adam says that uh, one of the switches may not have uh, latched up for the telescopic boom, but from our perspective, the signal looks very comparable between all the booms which did have micro switches. Um, the up leg, the digital accelerometer and the analog accelerometer, they all still saw that periodic pulse. Uh, not quite sure what that is, whether it is something banging around or uh, if it's some leaking uh, ACS gas or dead band, not quite sure. Uh, but after the Apogee, um, that thing mostly went away. So the down leg was a lot cleaner. It was still there, but but an order of magnitude smaller. Overall, um, the sub payloads all look good. Uh, the D1 seemed to show very little coning, although D2 and D3 did have coning on them. So a lot more assessment to be done. Uh, but overall, yeah, all of the all of the sub payloads came out, and it seems like all of the booms deployed. None of them got stuck. Uh, and some finer details to work out, but all in all, good. Happy to hear that. Thanks, PI. As we just heard uh, from the PI himself, uh, nominal data coming back. Uh, he seems very happy with the second vehicle. The first one uh, was same, same. So we still have the third vehicle left to uh, leave Wallops here today as part of the three-part, three-vehicle APET mission. Our next T0 is targeted for 2050 GMT or uh, 1615 local here. We're at about 18 and a half minutes and counting. Barring uh, any holds, as you know, on the second vehicle, we had a, uh, a couple minute hold around three minutes, uh, which pushed our T0 back. But uh, looks like we're, we're marching on now. And uh, until someone sees something where they would like to call a hold, we may do that again around the three minute mark. Uh, we had the opportunity to uh, interview our PI, Dr. Oro uh, Berjadia. I think you did that, right? My team member in here got to interview. Uh, Dr. Rajadia, he's a, he's a professor of engineering and physics at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Florida. And uh, he explains some of the uh, science here that he's looking for. Uh, so he was when asked, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, myself included, what is the ionosphere and uh, why is it important for scientists to study this region of near-Earth space? He answered with the ionosphere is an upper layer of our atmosphere extending from about 100 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers, 60 to 600 miles roughly. Uh, and there, the pressure is low enough that charged particles can remain free and show collective behavior. This layer reflects and reflects, refracts radio signals, and it also impacts satellite communications as the signals pass through. Thus, understanding it and being able to model its dynamics is crucial to making sure that our increasingly communication-dependent and driven world has a smooth operation. So it's all good things we're looking for here today. The eclipse gave us a targeted time and space to throw science and collect data uh, rather than uh, as mentioned earlier a two to three week campaign in order to co collect science this eclipse gave us a two to three hour window where we could uh, launch three vehicles and then sub payloads for a total of around 12 to 15 different data sets that they're going to take back and study to better prepare us uh, 
uh, to be able to model that ionosphere and prepare for perturbations in the future that may happen. Uh, uh, next, he was asked in just a few sentences, explain what APEP stands for and briefly describe the overarching goal of the project. Uh, APEP is, of course, an acronym. It stands for Atmospheric Perturbations Around the Eclipse Path. And as the eclipse shadow races through the atmosphere, the rapid and local sunset and sunrise create large-scale waves and small-scale perturbations that have the capability to interfere with radio communication. APEP's main goal is to study and characterize these perturbations. Again, we are currently 16 minutes and counting with no holds with a targeted T0 for our third and final rocket today, our third and final vehicle in a three rocket salvo of uh, 2050 GMT or that 1615 local. Did I say 2050? 2015 GMT, 1615 local time. We will launch our third and final rocket as part of the APEP mission. As we see, uh, we will be launching from the 50K launcher. If you're ready for them, I'm ready. Preliminary wind weighted settings are as follows azimuth 101.0, elevation 79.0. Azimuth 101.0, elevation 79.0. Good read back. Copy that. Check 532 LC ROA. Go for LC. Preliminary 50K launcher wind weighted settings are 101.0, elevation 79.0. LC copies and work. MNO, DPM. MNO. PM, PD, SRPO. Stand by. Go for PM. For TD. PI is requested that we hold at T minus 10. Copy. Program will hold us at 10. Roger, hold at 10. And as you heard, passing 13 minutes and 25 seconds and counting right now, we're going to hold at 10 and minutes. Recorders are started. Currently, the range working, no issues. Okay, well, this will be our third Go and ahead. final vehicle from the three rocket K launcher. Preliminary wind weighting settings are azimuth. One zero one decimal zero, elevation seven nine decimal zero. Copy that. Check five three three. And that's our final input to the azimuth and elevation for the launch rail that will send our third and final vehicle into the ionosphere here today from Wallace Flight Facility. We uh, we missed uh, uh, the range checks again. I, I've been trying to get them in the range, but I, I was talking too much, and uh, I was just reminded we missed range checks again, which gives us a, a great opportunity to see into behind the scenes here the folks that all have a, a say in how this goes. Of course, our test director runs the RCC in the room, along with range safety, the PM, our PI, and surveillance, but uh, so many folks are polled before we go into a launch. I just want to read down some of those folks. Uh, radar coordinator, RC, MNO, mission and operations lead, the programmer, the LWO, or Launch Weather Officer, LC, is the launch control you just heard take the final settings from the uh, ROA. Uh, LPM is our Launch Pad Manager, part of our Ground Ops, our Range Ground Ops group that's out on the, out on the uh, Wallops Island uh, that prepares the pad and the launchers. They're in some of those buildings and shelters you see in the live feed out on the island. Our Surveillance Control Officer, or SCO, our Range Chief Engineer, our main payload uh, instruments, our payload control, NASROC payload telemetry, swarm TM, swarm payload control, 
uh, our attitude control system, the NASROC mission manager, our PI, of course, SRPO. And then uh, we end with the range with the project manager or PM, the RSO and range safety officer. And then finally our test director all have to give a go uh, according to information that's coming in with range uh, activity, weather, uh, range foulers, which we're currently experiencing none of. So we have boats, surface vessels, and uh, aircraft that we keep clear of the area via our surveillance assets. So all of those folks and that team comprises what it takes to launch these vehicles from Wallace Flight Facility. And we've done two today. We're going to get our third, which will be uh, quite a quite a, a milestone. I know in the past we've launched uh, Atrax with a five rocket uh, mm -hmm. salvo. I don't remember the year. I was in surveillance at the time. I don't remember the year, but we did launch five in five minutes. Uh, back in 2010, we're Googling right now. We're trying to figure it out. 2012, not quite to the teens. Okay, 2012, five rocket launch uh, from right here at Wallace Flight Facility. And today, we get to experience three inside of a total eclipse here on the East Coast, only 81% totality. We're coming out of it now. Uh, if you're able to make it outside, we both uh, stuck our head out and felt the uh, the change in the atmosphere. It got chilly. It got dark like it was going to rain. Yeah, the birds were chirping. It was very serene here on the eastern seaboard. Uh, it's a beautiful sight, and uh, but it was a bit, uh, it was different. Definitely a change, drop in temperature and sunlight. And uh, we had our safe glasses on so we could observe the eclipse at 81% totality. So we'll stand by now as we're approaching. Here we're going to lock on 10 minutes, I think, and counting. And boom, we're there. We're 10 minutes and counting. Now for uh, our third and final launch, we'll listen in and wait for the PI to give us uh, his go when to pick up the count, and we'll get a new targeted T0 for you in just minutes. TD is a PM. Go for TD. We're looking at a new T0 of approximately 1620, um, adding five minutes, and we'll update that as time moves on. TV cops.
programmer. Go for TV. We're not going to be picking up at 2020, is that correct? GD's a PM, you have to pick up. I'm going to pick it up at 2010? Yeah, Roger, I, I was uh, looking at the wrong display. Oh. All right. We This is SRPO, SRPO to TD. We do want to go ahead and pick it up on the next even. Roger, next even. We'll be picking it up at 2011 Zula. So as we just heard, we're preparing to pick up the count in about 25 seconds at uh, 4, 11 p.m. Eastern time. That would set us up for a 421 T0 Eastern time from our uh, 50K launcher, the third and final rocket in the APEP mission here from Wallops Flight Facility. As we prepare to enter uh, the terminal count at 10, 10 minutes. Let's listen in. Imminent Clear range control. Please start recorders again. DPM MNO recorders are running. Thank you, sir. Check 531. PLC check 535. ACS check 538539. SRPLTD, are we counting straight through? Stand by. RC, DPM. RC, go. Requesting interrogation of transponder. In work. PLC check 536. PLC check 537. MNO DPM. MNO. Record RF parameters and report TM lock. Stand by. TDPM, we will be holding at T minus three minutes for no more than five. DPM MNO. Our parameters recorded nominal. TM is locked. Copy that. Check 541542. RSO, this is PM. This is RSO, go ahead. We're going to hold a T minus three for not more than five minutes. How's that? Yeah, that hopefully should be no issue. Copy, thank you. And TD programmer uh, copies uh, three minutes. Hold. And DPMRC. Go ahead. Beacon is trackable. Good five. Code good lock. Thank you, sir. Check 543. As we listen in and hear the range, check through the Go No Go Go criteria uh, for the launch countdown. We passed seven minutes, 30 seconds and counting with an expected hold at T minus three minutes. From SRPO and the PI, SPLC something uh, the PO, PI would like to see probably science-wise. We're, we're experiencing no weather or range fouler uh, phenomena currently, so we're Verifying good to go for launch. We're just going to get to a spot where uh, Dr. Aro Rajadia, our PI, is happy with the science, and we will launch our third and final rocket today as part of NASA's Atmospheric Perturbations Around the Eclipse Path, or APEP, mission check five, from Wallops eight. Flight Facility here in Virginia. Check five, four, six. Again, at EXP three minutes, five, we will hold seven, for no longer than field. five. So let's listen in and we'll target a new T-0. DPM, this is MNO. MNO, I can give you readout has a lock on swarms one through four. 6 p.m. lock on one through three. Copy that, MNO, check 549. STM check 550. 
TXP, check 551, good swarm data. RSO, ROA. Is RSO, go ahead. Provide final wind weighted settings for 50K. This. SPLC check 552. Five, right. Final wind waiting settings are as follows. Azimuth 101 decimal 2, elevation 79 decimal 2. Azimuth 101 decimal 2, elevation 79 decimal 2. Good read back. LC ROA. Go for LC. 50K launcher, final wind weighted settings are azimuth 101 decimal 2, elevation 79 decimal 2. LC copies and work. ROA LC. Go ahead. 50K launcher final wind waiting settings are azimuth 101 decimal 2, elevation 79 decimal 2. Copy that, check 555. minutes and holding. RSO, PM. It's RSO, go ahead. How long can we hold here with our current balloon? 
Stand by. We could do maybe another five minutes, but if we're going to go much past that, we're going to have to do another balloon. That's going to take time to actually get that balloon up there going, cut settings, and get you new settings. So it's hold another five minutes, and that's going to take some extra time. Copy that, Arso. Thank you. Is that five minutes from right now, or five minutes from what the plan we have right now? That's five minutes from right now. Copy. maximum but obviously you're incurring extra risk of us going out in variability so but anything after that we're definitely gonna have to get another balloon PM did you copy copy or so TD uh, we're gonna target 1628 for our T0 did you copy copy did you copy programmer programmer copies uh, targeted T0 2028 Zulu. All right, so we just heard a new T0 1628 now targeting. Uh, you heard a little chatter there between the PM and the RSO and the TD uh, asking about uh, balloons. Uh, we do launch weather balloons here that give us uh, wind weighted settings for our launchers. So the balloons are launched from Wallace Flight Facility, mainland and island, uh, and we get from that we get at altitude, uh, wind, velocity, and direction. So uh, the, the range safety officer and their team will evaluate uh, the wind weighting settings, the, the, set, the, uh, the data from the balloons in order to give us good settings for the uh, launcher settings for the rail. So that's what you heard RSO. He didn't want too old of data. Uh, we like to keep our data fresh on what the winds are at elevation. So we know that we are providing uh, safety to the public out there when we launch these vehicles from the launcher. So that's what you heard there in that little interchange there between RSO, PM, and TD uh, in, in our efforts to get the science window, the PI wants, and remaining uh, within safe parameters for launch. So we are now, uh, we're still at three minutes in holding. When we pick it up, we're looking at a 1628 or 20. 28 GMT launch, which would be just over five minutes, four minutes from now. All stations this net, all stations this net. Stand by to pick up the count in less than 30 seconds.
All right, as we heard from PM, we're about to pick up the count in 15 seconds. We will be three minutes from counting, lots of range chatter going on the net. So we will stand by. We've got a great picturesque view there off of our front porch in the Atlantic Ocean and our 50K launcher for our third and final launch as part of the APEP mission. PLC check 556. PLC check 557. ACS check 558. MNO DPM. DPM, this is the MNO. I can give you a good TM lock and verify no changes on TM signal strength. Copy that. Check 559-561. RC DPM. RC go. Confirm no change in transponder. Confirm no change. Check 560. PLC check 562 and 563. Actual launcher settings are azimuth 101.2, decibel two, elevation 79.2. decibel two. PTM check 564. PLC check 565. Copy that LC check ACS check 567. Experiment, you go. Experiment, go. PLC. PLC, go. PTM. Go. STM. STM, go. ACS. Go. PI. Go. SRPO. Go. Check 568-569. SPLC, check 571, go. 50 seconds. Minus 40. Minus 30. Arm verified. Check item 575. Minus 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, check 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, mark, T0. Radars are tracking. Plus 10. Ignition squib and motor pressure. Plus Radar 20. Two and three on the booster. Plus 30. Plus 40. Burnout. Plus 50. D spin squib. One minute. Sub squib and brake wire. ACS one on. Door squib and all plunger switches. Eject squib, on. all brake wires. Skirt squib and brake wires. Flash on the booster. ACS2. STM has lock on all swarms. All are transmitting at high power. All radars on payload. Check 
Boom, deploy squib. ACS-2 aligned. All pots. And as we hear the chatter quiet down, we heard uh, we had splash on the first stage. Uh, we also had good tracking on the radars. The PI seems happy now. There at the bottom center screen, you see the PM behind him, test director up on the pedestal. Uh, everyone now intently looking at data screens directly in front of them on our video wall in the range control center. And uh, they will uh, collect the data now, head back to the laboratory. To uh, make sure they get everything happy, I want to thank you for joining us today uh, for the coverage of our uh, NASA's APEP mission, an acronym for Atmospheric Perturbations Around the Eclipse Path. I just had to say that one word one more time, perturbations. I practiced all week on that. So we, uh, we launched three rockets today as part of a salvo on all three of our launchers uh, from the pad on Wallops Island. Uh, pretty exciting day. I hope you enjoyed the eclipse. We'll leave you with a What's Up at Wallops video here. And we'll see you again. Look, make sure you tune in to our social media pages uh, for updates on everything going on at Wallops. Good day.